All right. Okay, so just a couple of announcements, things coming up around the corner here. So men's golf tournament, May 29th, Lady Smith uh, Par 3. Uh, that sounds like a really good time. Uh, looking ahead to June, we're going to be celebrating our 2021 graduates. And uh, later in the month, we'll be celebrating with a dad's panel on Father's Day. And then one more thing, um, on your clipboards is these prayer cards. We really encourage you guys, uh, fill out a prayer request card for something that you're praying for that we can pray together as a church or, or a person that you're praying for salvation or just something you want to thank God for together. And then the following Sunday, we'll, we'll pray for those items corporately. So, um, yeah, with that, let's uh, pray and let's start our service. God, thank you so much for uh, your faithfulness and thank you for your love for us. Thank you that uh, we can even be here together like this this morning. There's many places in the world that, that can't gather, and uh, we're just thankful that we can gather. And, and we're looking forward to the time where we can gather indoors with more people. But God, uh, we're just thankful for the things that you've uh, allowed for us during this season. So Lord, we want to we wanna invite you here. We know you're already here, but we welcome you here. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you speak to us uh, the things that you want to share with us this morning and open our hearts and minds. So we love you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome this morning, everybody. Why don't we stand as we worship together this morning? Your lyrics for worship are in the little bulletins on your clipboard. So you can pull those out and um, just have an idea of what we're singing. And worship with us this morning. Let's declare these truths over every situation every circumstance in your life this morning. We're going to start with see a victory and how many know that we can count on a victory because of Jesus and because of what he's done for us. Amen. Amen. See 
trust you this morning. Even if victory doesn't look like how we think it might look, God, we trust in your victory this morning, God. I pray that faith would arise in every heart that's here this morning, Jesus, that we would trust you. We would trust in your victory, that victory that you won on the cross and your resurrection from the grave. We just trust you this morning, oh God. Well, we put our trust in you this morning, God. Oh, we trust you, Jesus.
good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to the Most High. It is good to proclaim your unfailing love in the morning and your faithfulness in the evening. So, Lord, we just want to uh, pray for some of the uh, the things that we've we've seen on these prayer cards this last week. And uh, Father, we lift them up to you together as a body of believers, and we we trust that you hear our words and that you you work and you act through them. So, Father, we pray for the salvations of the many family members and friends and neighbors um, that, that we're all praying for individually. We, we come to you together, and, and God, we just ask that you, you make yourself known to them. And, Father, we pray for marriages in this church. We pray for strong and healthy marriages and, and for those ones that maybe aren't doing the best right now. God, we just ask that you, you move and that you bring peace and love and joy into those marriages. Father, we want to pray for um, yeah this this mother who's struggling with some some elderly issues and and all the things that are are needed as we as we look to our parents in their older age and Lord just give this family wisdom and and uh, Lord we pray that you bring peace for this mother as well. Uh, we pray for freedom from smoking, God. We pray for anyone who's struggling with with smoking or addiction. We just ask for freedom and uh, yeah that you just release that person in Jesus' name. And God, we also want to pray for uh, this jaw surgery that's coming up. And, and uh, Lord, we ask that your hand would be with the doctors and that, that this surgery would go well and it would be successful. We pray for uh, the larger vehicle that this family is needing and, and uh, also for this place that uh, our, our family member needs to live. God, we just lift all these things up to you. We thank you that you're a God who hears, that you're a God who cares, that you're a God who sees every detail of our lives. We're so grateful for you, God, and we're so grateful that we can be here together this morning. And uh, we just commit the rest of our time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Tristan. You guys can take a seat. It's so good to be together with you. I just, I just love the fact that we can still meet together in this capacity. It's so, so good to see you all. So um, before we get into the message this morning, I just want to speak actually to the camera for a moment because there are a number of people that, uh, that have not made it down yet to gather with us. And I want to invite you, uh, if you're a part of Duncan Pentecostal, Church, Pente- Duncan Pentecostal Church family, even if you're not a part of our church family, I want to invite you, come join with us. Um, we, if you were to look around with the camera right now, we are sitting socially distanced. We have masks on. It is safe. Uh, we are adhering to all the restrictions and guidelines that have been placed upon us. And I'd love to invite you to come join us. So I'd love to see you here in the coming weeks. And even if um, eventually we're praying and hoping that the restrictions lift, we can move back inside, we're going to continue to meet regardless. So whether it's outdoors or inside, I want to invite you to come and be a part of things here. So great to have you all with us. So either way, And uh, if you have been following along with us through our study of the book of Exodus, we've been in the book of Exodus now for a number of months, and we've been kind of seeing this battle between God and Pharaoh, as Pharaoh has repeatedly, or sorry, God has repeatedly asked Pharaoh through Moses to let my people go, right? We've heard this message over and over and over again, let my people go, that they may serve me, that they may worship me. And there's been this kind of... um, stubborn refusal and resisting on the part of, of Pharaoh to let God's people go, right? And it's, it's, we, we've seen incredible plague upon plague come upon the nation of Egypt. The, the nation now, at this point, we've gone through nine plagues, and it's basically in ruins. Uh, the nation is pretty much destroyed, and the land, and, and there's been death of, of all kinds of things going on. But um, in Exodus chapter 11 and 12 this morning, we're going to see God confront Pharaoh, um, King Pharaoh, with another king. There's going to be another king that God brings on the scene this morning. And that is the king of death. Death, right? Death is kind of probably one of the most unpopular subjects uh, in our times, is it not? People don't like to talk about it, let alone even think about it the majority of the time. But death is a king. You know that the Bible actually tells us that. Uh, in Job chapter 18, verse 14, death is called the king of terrors. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26 tells us that it it is the last enemy. And this final plague that God is going to bring upon Pharaoh and upon the nation of Egypt is the plague of death. The death of the firstborn of all that are in Egypt. And of course, this will be the last blow uh, to proud Pharaoh. Except for that won't be the only death. There'll be other death that will take place in Egypt at this time. And that will be uh, not of human death, but of a lamb. 
Because aside from uh, the death of a lamb amongst the household of the Israelites, uh, there would be freedom for them. It would set them free. They would actually, uh, death would not visit the Jews. You see, for death, for some, death is the end. But for others, death is actually, it can be the beginning. As we're going to see God secure freedom for his people from Egypt through death. So this morning, listen, if you have, um, if you have a Bible, I encourage you, open it up at this time. Some of you I know maybe use your phone, your cell phone, or a tablet, something like that. I encourage you, uh, open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 11, because we're going to be covering a whole bunch of scripture this morning, and it's going to help you a whole bunch if you have a Bible to follow along with. So why don't we, uh, why don't we quickly pray before we, um, before we get into the passage this morning? And, uh, yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for, for again, uh, the, the rain is not upon us right now. We thank you for that. We thank you for the sun, in fact, that is even shining. We thank you that we can gather. We thank you, Jesus, that we can worship you uh, out in the open. Lord, that we can declare your wonders this morning together as church family. And I thank you for your word. Your word that, that is never restricted, is never hindered, always goes forth. May it accomplish today all that you have set for it to do in each and every heart that is here and that even later we'll be watching this video online. We love you and we thank you so much. Amen. Uh, if you're following along, I encourage you, uh, we're in the English Standard Version. That's the passage or the text rather that I will be using this morning to preach from. And the first thing that we're going to see this morning uh, in Exodus chapter 11 are last words. Last words before death. That's kind of what we're going to see here. If you remember back in chapter 10, we finished, it off, finished off the chapter with Pharaoh basically uh, kicking Moses out of his presence. But it wasn't before some last words that Moses has for Pharaoh that we're going to read here in chapter 11. The Lord said to Moses, some translations actually say the Lord had said. It was previously that he had told Moses this because it's in the presence of Pharaoh that Moses says these things. Yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Now, we know that there, of course, were 10 plagues because we've read the stories or we've at least seen the movies, right? We know there were 10 plagues. But for Moses and, in fact, for all of Israel, they didn't know how many plagues there would be. All they knew is that the final plague would be the death of the firstborn in Egypt. That's all that, that Moses and the Israelites knew. So at this point now, they're told the final plague, this is it, no more. So they know that this is it, number 10. And the day has come, finally. And in fact, this plague is going to be so bad, God tells them, that not only will Pharaoh let you go, he actually says he's going to drive you out of Egypt. I think as I read that, I think it's almost like Pharaoh, it's like he's going to be a chauffeur. He's going to hop in the bus and he's going to be like, get in, we're going. It's time for you to get out of here. That's what's going to happen. He's not just going to let them go, he's going to drive them out. It goes on in verse 2. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Now let me ask you this. If you were to go and ask your neighbors for gold and silver jewelry, what do you think would happen? Yeah, they'd probably laugh in your face, right? This is obviously the, fair, uh, the favor of God. In fact, he says that. I'm going to give you favor. The word for favor there is actually grace. I'm going to give you grace. It's not deserved. It's basically God saying, my doing, not yours. And not only would they get some jewelry, we're going to see in Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, that it actually says that they plundered the Egyptians. That's how much jewelry, gold and silver jewelry they're going to get. They plundered them in a sense. And in many ways, this would be back pay for their hundreds of years of slavery. In a lot of ways, that's what's going on. And God's going to be like, here you go, here's your due. And it wasn't, let me just be clear here, it wasn't so that they could be the best dressed in Canaan. That's not what's going on here. This would actually be provision for them as they travel. They're going to be in the wilderness for quite a number of years, as you've probably read the text ahead and you know what's going to happen. But it also is going to be to provide materials for the tabernacle that we'll see also get constructed later on in the Israelites. So verse 4, Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. In other words, no Egyptian is going to be left untouched from the highest to the lowest. It didn't matter. And not just even human, but he says even of animal, the firstborn would be killed. There shall be such a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. Really what God's doing here is he's giving them a taste of their own medicine, isn't he? 
If you remember, as we studied through Exodus, that, that numerous times we've seen the people of Israel cry out to God in their anguish and in their suffering, as they were suffering under horrible slavery and as their, their baby boys were being having to be thrown into the Nile. They cried out to God. And God is going to now put this back onto the Egyptians. They're going to face it. And some people might wonder, well, why, why all Egypt? I mean, why not just Pharaoh? Pharaoh's been kind of the key figure in all this. But the reality is, is that all Egypt was involved in the persecution of the Jews. Let's be honest. Uh, whether, whether there was the, the blind eye that was perhaps turned to what was going on, you're still guilty if you just turn a blind eye, aren't you? And you do nothing about it. Or perhaps the spying eye that would turn in. There's thou, you got to remember, there's about a million, uh, sorry, two to three million Israelites that are in Egypt at this time. How is Pharaoh going to know about all these babies being born when they're born? Well, obviously, Egyptians, they were all conspiring together to, to cause this in many ways. And so they t- were all taking part in this. It was a concerted effort And so all Egypt would cry like never before. But, verse 7, look at verse 7. Not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. So now Moses finally leaves. So that was kind of the conclusion uh, between after chapter 10, they're really what's going on here. Then the Lord said to Moses, verse nine, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Even, not, even though Moses is nine for nine, Pharaoh's not gonna listen. Stubborn Pharaoh, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. Pharaoh's stubbornness would come at an absolutely devastating cost. Okay, we, we know this. What would happen? He, I mean, he essentially has lost his kingdom. His, his, the, the, the world is crumbling around him. But the, dev, the most devastating part is he's gonna, it's going to come at the cost of his firstborn even. Isn't this crazy? You know, and I, it just kind of reminds me, what would God's perhaps his last words be to you? What would his final warnings be to you, his last warning? And perhaps what is the stubbornness that in, is in your life? What's it costing you? What is your stubbornness costing you? What's it costing others perhaps? You know, eventually it always hurts someone else, doesn't it? Whether it be a firstborn of yours, whether it be a grandchild, someone somewhere. And I just encourage you, use this time while you can, listen to God's warnings, turn to him. Now, secondly, we see that death can bring a new start. Death can bring a new start. By the way, we just finished a whole chapter. Do you know that? We just did chapter 11 in like six minutes. I'm aiming, I think we can finish Exodus this morning. So, so we'll see. We'll see how far we go. If we keep up at this pace, man, we're flying. So we're on to chapter 12. We've now made our chapter 12. And chapter 12 for us explains the Passover, the Passover for Israel. And extremely, in fact, it's not an extremely, it is the most important uh, day for Israel. The, the Passover feast would be the most important feast for them that they would remember. See, for Egypt, it meant the death of the firstborn, but for Israel, through the death of a lamb, it meant their deliverance and their salvation. And it was a new start for Israel. And really, the, the whole Passover, you've got to understand this, is kind of like a play or a drama for us. And what it pictures, what it figures, is it, it shows us the world, it shows us sin, and it shows us Jesus. In the Passover, we see all these pictures and all these symbols played out for us. You see, Egypt in many ways is like a picture of the world, a picture of the world that refuses uh, to to repent and to turn to God after his warnings, after his his pleadings with them, his requests. And in many ways, that's the picture of Egypt, a world that will actually one day be judged. That's what we get from the the picture of the death of the firstborn that's going to happen this morning that we're going to see. But the lamb, let me tell you about the lamb. The lamb in the Passover is probably one of the most clearest pictures of of Jesus in the Old Testament that we get. The lamb is Jesus. And, uh, you know, don't forget that Jesus himself told us in John chapter 5, he says all the, 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 the Old Testament basically points and speaks of me. That's what Jesus said. And this is one of the clearest pictures that we get. John the Baptist even, uh, what did he say when he saw Jesus walking, coming near? What did he call him? He said, behold the, the what? the lamb. Behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And Paul was super clear. He didn't pull any punches. He said this in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Jesus is the lamb, okay, that sets us free from slavery to this world, to sin, and to judgment. That is the picture that we're going to see this morning. So chapter 12 begins, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, 
This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So the first thing we really see here is this is, gonna be, this is such a big deal that, G, that God actually says to Israel, this is a brand new start. You're actually going to begin your calendar now. Your religious calendar is now going to begin with this month. This is how significant what is taking place. It's going to be a marker for them of what God is going to do. Passover was to be a marker of when everything changed. You know, the same is totally true for us. When you give your life to Christ, what does 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tell us? It says, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's a new start. When you give your life to Christ, it's kind of like a, a new calendar. Your life begins from that point. How many of you uh, tend to kind of think in your life in terms of when I got saved, right? Oftentimes, we kind of have this, this period in our life before we were saved, and then this period of life once we were saved. That's like the marker point, isn't it, for many of us? I think of, personally for me, I was saved as a young boy, age four. I gave my life to Christ, but really I kind of was up and down. Grade 12, I look at kind of, that's when my life began, because that was when I fully surrendered my life to Jesus. It was a marker for me, grade 12. It's like my calendar begins at grade 12, if I think about my life. You know, it, it's interesting because the whole world even, if you think about it, marks their days from the birth of Christ, right? Don't tell them that. I mean, they might think, oh, we're, oh they, they are trying to change it, right? But 2021 is the year we are living in. And of course, what do we use a couple letters after that? Anno Domini, which literally means in the year of our Lord. We actually mark our calendars from the time that Jesus has come. He has altered the whole world. And that's what God was saying here. This is so significant, it's going to alter your calendars. You're going to begin your year, your days from this point with what I'm going to do. But this new start would require a death. Look at verse three. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, which was the month of Nisan, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Now notice that it was a lamb not per person, and it wasn't even a lamb per, for the nation, but it was a lamb per household, wasn't it? And it's actually said that, you know what, if you're an individual and you're not a part of a family, go find one. That's what God says. Take, join families, join together, right? This focus totally, uh, Dr. Dobson would be happy because there's such a focus on the family here, right? That's what God's doing. The focus is on the family. If you're too small, join with others. If your family's too small, join with another family, the whole, and what does Christ do, of course, when we come to Christ? What does he do? He sets us in families. We all, you know what's lovely? We're all, if, if it weren't COVID, we could, right now I'd get you all, you're all, you're all thankful, all, especially Austin, that I'm not going to make you hug right now. But that's what I could do. We're family. And, and, and we could, we, we're family. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that's what he does in Christ. He sets us in family, the body of Christ. Well, next we're going to see specific instructions about the lamb. And don't forget, the lamb is a picture of Jesus. So look at this. Your lamb shall be without blemish. See, the lamb would only be an acceptable sacrifice if it were pure, if it were spotless, if it were blameless, without defect whatsoever. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You see, his perfect, sinless life was the only acceptable sacrifice that could be given in place of ours. You could die on the cross. You could. Any of you could. But it wouldn't do you any good, right? Because you are with blemish. You are with spot, otherwise known as sin. And so Jesus was the only one. He needed no savior. That's why he could die in our place as, as our savior. Verse 5 continues. Also, this lamb needs to be a male a year old. So the lamb was to be killed in the prime of its life. The very prime of its life, this lamb was to be killed. Of course, when was Jesus killed? 33 years old. Jesus, in the prime of his life, some you know, little kids would think, 33, that's so old. And then the rest of us that have already passed 33 are like, no man, that's the prime of your life. I'm looking back at 33, you know, that was like 11, almost 12 years ago for me now. 33, that was the prime, man. You're feeling good, you're strong, you can do anything, and you know everything. Right? So in the prime of his life, Jesus gave up his life. Verse 5 goes on even further. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So on the 10th of, of the month, the lamb was to be taken into the household. That's what we read in the text here. 
and it was to be kept there until the 14th. So for four days, this lamb was to be brought in and to live with the family. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The first reason being so that they could inspect the lamb, to make sure that the lamb was spotless, that there was no defect, that there was nothing wrong with the lamb. But a second reason was so that as they would be with that lamb, I mean, it would almost be like a pet. Think about it. 14 days, this one-year-old lamb kind of following you everywhere, in and out of your house. It was to live in the house with you. You would start to realize this lamb is totally innocent. It's done nothing wrong. Yet it's going to have to die for me, for my freedom. Right? Do you see this is, the, this, is, this is the picture that we have of Jesus? Do you know what day Jesus rode into Jerusalem and declared himself to be the king of the Jews? The 10th day of Nisan. This very day when God said, pick your lamb. Go pick your lamb. And do you know what? For the next four days, do you know what happened? Jesus would be inspected, wouldn't he? He would be, be brought before the religious leaders who would, would bring all kinds of false witnesses and false testimony that would not line up. Try to convict him to say that he's guilty. Of course, he was not guilty. What did Pilate declare? Uh, there's nothing wrong with him. I find nothing wrong. This man's innocent. Declared totally innocent. He'd done nothing wrong. And not only this, later, he would be whipped and he'd be beaten and he'd be punished. Now, was it for his own sin? No, it was for ours, wasn't it? For our sin. He was innocent. And then he'd be crucified on the Passover, dying just before midnight. And I also want you to notice something here. Notice the progression that, gets, that, that happens in our text. If you, I don't know if you picked up on this, but in verse 3, they were told to take a lamb. In verse 4, they were then said to make your count as a family for the lamb. And then in verse 5, they, God then tells them, your lamb shall be without blemish. A lamb, the lamb, and your lamb. You can look at it in verse 3, 4, and 5. And the New Testament obviously speaks to us as well of Jesus as a savior, as the savior, but also your savior. And that is so important because it's not enough just for Jesus to be a savior or even the savior. He must be your savior. And we get this picture here. Verse seven, then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and lintel of the houses in which they eat it. So notice something important here is he tells them to, the lintel is like the, the, the header over the door right? And then the posts. And they would take the blood and put it across the, the top of the door and down the sides, but not the threshold. Isn't that interesting? Of course, putting it, hi, Teresa, come on in, come on in. Putting the blood on, on the top and then down the sides would form the shape of a cross, but then not on the threshold. God says nothing about the threshold, of course, because we're never to trample on the blood of Christ, are we? We never step on the blood of Christ. And not only that, what's important is that it had to be applied. You notice it wasn't enough just to kill this lamb, right? The blood had to be applied. Uh, Christ's sacrifice in the same way for my sin, it does no good if it's not applied to my life by faith, does it? You know, John 1, 12, speaking of Jesus says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Folks, it's not enough for Jesus to be a good teacher, to be a great example, to be a great prophet, a miracle worker. That's not enough. You have to trust him as your savior, your savior, not as a or the savior, but your savior and apply the blood to your life. Verse eight, they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, symbolizing all the suffering, of course, that Jesus would have to go through, right? Suffering the wrath and the fire of God essentially for us in his suffering and on the cross. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So the bitter herbs, uh, would be eaten with this meal. And that was to remind Israel in the future, it was to remind them of how bitter their time was in Egypt. Because the reality is, is that they're going to start to glamorize Egypt. We're going to see it very shortly. They're going to get into the wilderness and be like, Egypt was so much better. And God's like, no, 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 no. Every time you take this Passover annually, you need to eat it with bitter herbs to remind you of how garbage the time was that you were facing in Egypt. Not only that, but it also pictures for us the bitterness that Jesus had to suffer for us, what he went through for us, also to help us to remind us not to want to return to that old life, right? That was the point. Israel, don't go back to that life. It was horrible. You may glamorize it, but it wasn't good. It goes on, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. You see, what would happen if you boiled the lamb? What would, a couple things would happen. The meat would begin to fall off, right? If you ever boil meat and it just kind of falls off the bone. Well, Jesus, of course, gave himself wholly for us, completely for us, every bit of himself. That's a picture there. Not only that, but to 
boil a lamb, you'd have to break its bones to fit into a pot, right? And, and, and you know, what's amazing is that the scriptures tell us that not a lamb, of, or sorry, not a bone of Jesus was to be broken in his sacrifice for us. And that, again, gets pictured there. Verse 10, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. So in other words, there'll be no MLT sandwiches the next morning. No mutton, lettuce, tomato, okay? The mutton, nice and lean, tomatoes ripe. Some of you picking up on that perhaps. Sorry, Miracle Max, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't be happy with that one, but if you've ever seen Princess Bride, right? So, but the purpose of this was, it had, to, it had to be burned because the reality was that the lamb was not to see any corruption. The lamb was not to start to, take, to, to, to decay. The lamb was not to start having maggots form in it. Of course, because Christ never saw corruption. Did his body see corruption? The Bible spoke of that. No, he resurrected from the dead. In this manner, verse 11, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So, so they were to eat and to partake of this symbol of their salvation, ready to go at a moment's notice. That was what they were to have to do. Just as as Christians, we are to be ready to leave this world behind at a moment's notice, aren't we? Goes on, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Hence the name Passover. Why? Because God would pass over the houses that had the blood of the lamb applied to it. But any home without the blood applied to it, they would face death. They would see the death of the firstborn. You know what, this, and we sometimes maybe think, oh, this is every Jew. Well, maybe not. There could have been those Jews that were like, ah, I'm not going to kill a lamb and put its blood. I'll take the lamb, I'll, I'll kill it, I'll eat it. I'm not going to put the blood, up. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to apply it to the doorpost and that's just a waste of time. They would see the death of the firstborn. That's simply what, that's all that we're told would happen. If he saw blood over that house, they would be saved. This could apply even to maybe any Egyptians that perhaps heard what God was going to do and were like, I'm doing that. I've seen these nine plagues. I've seen what that God can do. I'm going to do the same thing and I'm going to apply the blood to my house. It didn't matter how pure you were. It didn't matter what nationality you were. You just had to have the blood applied. You know, scripture upon scripture tells us that Christ's blood covers us. Isn't that beautiful? The blood of Christ covers us. It's not about your goodness. It's not about your nationality. It's not even if you're born into a Christian family or home. Have you applied the blood of Christ over your life, over your doorpost, over your lintel? That is the most important thing. You see, death does not have to be the end. It does not have to be the end uh, because Christ's death has ensured your freedom and all the judgment, all the wrath that we deserve can pass over us if we put our faith in Christ. So thirdly, we see this, how to live with this new start after Christ's death. How do you live now? How do we live now? We're going to see that in the text. Now I'm going to read a bunch here, um, beginning in verse 14. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. In other words, don't stop remembering as Christians what Christ has done for you. You need to always remember forever what Christ has done. How do we do that? How we set you free from bondage? How? Look at this, verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. Okay, remember that. That's important. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day, I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 14th day of the month at evening. Uh, what? Sorry. You shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day. Sorry. Sorry, I screwed that up from the 17th, so the 14th till the 21st, seven days. That's what he's saying, okay? You shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. 
whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread. I don't know if you got the picture there. You're kind of like, didn't you just read this over and over and over again? (laughs) God's driving something home here, a point here. What were you not to eat? Leaven. In fact, you're not even to eat anything with leaven. What else did he say? You actually have to take it out of your your house. Nothing leavened. And this was to start on the 14th day. What was the 14th day? What happened on the 14th? Passover. That's when they killed the lamb. On the 14th day, he says, this is when it would start. The 10th, you would take the lamb. The 14th, you would kill the lamb. And on the 14th at evening, for one week, they had to remove all leaven, which is just another word for yeast, from their homes. Not even in bread. Nothing, nowhere. Why is that? What is leaven or yeast a picture or a symbol of in scripture? Sin. Sin. You see, because just a little sin, right? You think about yeast, just a little bit of yeast goes through everything, spreads through everything, causes it all to, your bread to rise. Just a little bit, doesn't take much. Just like a little bit of sin spreads and pollutes in such a same way. It's, and it's often hidden, right? And it works silently in the background. It's this picture of sin. And similarly, we are saved through the Passover lamb. Who's the Passover lamb? Jesus. And following salvation, folks, we are no longer to live in sin. That's what scripture tells us. We're not to live in sin. We've been saved not to live some crummy life that we were in before in slavery. We've been saved to be a new creation, a new creation. But verse 16 told us this. It says that no work was to be done on the first day of the feast and on the seventh day of the feast at the start and the finish. No work, no work to be done. You know why? It's because salvation and redemption and freedom through Christ is a work 100% done by God from start to finish. It's based in what Jesus has done. However, notice this, okay? Israel was still required to do something. They were still required to remove all the leaven or the yeast from their homes. They were supposed to get rid of all of it. And, and the reason being that, you know, although they and us in the same way were declared righteous through the sacrifice of the land, through the sacrifice of Jesus, we don't just go now and say, well, you know what? God looks at me and sees the righteousness of Christ. So I'm just going to go live however old way I want to live. I'm going to do whatever I want. Is that how we're supposed to live as followers of Christ? Of course not, right? And so here's the thing. We also have to be actively involved in the removal of sin from our lives, okay? We do. We have a part to play in this as well. Philippians chapter 2, 12 and 13 tells us this. I think it pictures it well. It says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So what does that tell us? Do we have a role to play? Yeah, we need to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so we have a job to do. We've got to work at it, in a sense, is what God says. But then look at what verse 13 says. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, wait a minute. Who works? It just said that, that we got to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And now it's saying, but, but God's the one that works it out in us. So what's the answer? Did someone say both? I can't read lips with your masks on. If you said both, you're correct. The answer is yes. (laughs) Who? Yes. It's God and us. But don't miss the order. Notice that this feast began on the day of Passover, the day of their salvation. It's not get cleaned up and then come to Christ and get saved. Christ saves you, then he gives you the power. In fact, that's what verse 13, God works in you. It's God's power in you to will and to act according to his will and good purposes. Don't get the order mixed up. You come to Christ and he gives you the power to live a new life. You know, just one interesting thing before we move on. You know, I'm sure you're well aware that Jews still today observe the Passover in in Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem and around the world, Jews, uh, strict Jews will still observe Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And what it's interesting, I didn't know this, but I actually heard that if, um, if you were to travel to Israel and, um, and during, like during just leading up to Passover, and if you stay in a hotel, you'll see all these signs everywhere that say, do not bring any leaven into this hotel. No leaven allowed. It'll even say things like no bread allowed. All kinds of things like this. You go to your room. I was even told that if you go to your room you're in your hotel, it will even have the same thing. Signs, do not bring any leaven in here. No bread allowed. All this kind of stuff leading up to Passover. The reason being, and I didn't know this, but the reason being is that some of the strictest Jews and, and the um, like rabbis even, what they will do is they will check into a hotel for the Feast of Unleavened Bread so that they don't have to take any leaven out of their house. 
So they move into a hotel for seven days that has been made kosher, no leaven, and then at the end of that seven days, they move back into their home. Is that crazy? Just this little workaround that they figured out? It's so brutal. That's what religion does, right? It's such a... Ultimately, the picture is this. The picture is that once we are saved, we are no longer to live the life that we have once lived. That's, that's ultimately what God's getting at here. You are to live a new life in Christ. Now, finally, we see in this passage, be like Nike. Just do it, okay? In other words, it's not just enough to know the stuff. We need to do something with the information. Beginning in verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop. Now, if you remember, hyssop makes an appearance at the cross, does it not? If you remember, when Jesus is on the cross, they offer him uh, a sponge filled with um, sour wine. Do you know what kind of branch they held it up to him with? A hyssop branch, right? So again, this little foreshadow picture of the cross. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. Don't leave your house. Folks, we are to abide in Christ, are we not? Right? Don't roam away. Don't walk away from your salvation that is found in Christ alone. It's in Christ alone. Abide in him. For the Lord, verse 23 will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, the promised land, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. In other words, God's saying, don't forget what I have done for you this night. Pass it on, pass it on to your kids. You know, obviously we are never to forget what Christ has done for us. How do we do that? This do in remembrance of me right? We're always to remember. That's why we partake of the Lord's Supper together, to remind us of what Christ has done. Well, what is the only correct response to this incredible act that God is going to do? Verse 27, and the people bowed their heads and worshiped. They're going to be free. They're finally going to be free. You know what? It's the same for us. We are delivered. We are rescued. We have been passed over. And what is our only appropriate response? Worship. Notice verse 28, then the people of Israel went and did so, As the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. They didn't just view this as a suggestion. They obeyed. They did what the Lord asked them to do, right? As the Lord commanded, so they did. They just did it. And it's a good thing they did it because look at verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where someone was not dead. This is horrible, really. If you think about it, absolutely terrible, terrible tragedy. But God had warned them again and again and again. Verse 31, then he summoned Pharaoh, summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone. There's no more bargaining. There's no more trying to, okay, just the men can go, or okay, the families can go, but leave all your herds. Just go. And then notice what he finishes with. And bless me also. Pharaoh finally recognizes who God is, hey? Right? If you've seen this battle, At the beginning of it, Pharaoh didn't know who God was and he didn't care. Well, now he knows who is really God in Egypt and all the earth. We'll finish off here, verse 33. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls, and being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have as what they asked. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. You know, as we close this morning, horrible judgment, horrible tragedy struck every, every home in Egypt that did not have the blood applied to it. 
Egyptian homes, and I would say even any Jewish homes, any Israelite homes that did not apply the blood. Death came. And, and I just want to ask you this. Have you put your faith, your trust in Christ's Passover sacrifice? You see, one day there will be a judgment again. You know this. There's going to be a judgment again. And do you want God to pass over you or do you want God to linger over you in judgment? See, Passover is only possible if you do what God said to do, if you apply the blood of Christ over your house. Only you can accept or reject what Christ has offered. It's up to you. And in Christ, you can walk in freedom. You can be free from the leaven, from the sin that is in your life through his sacrifice. And the reality is this. You can be free because Christ, you know what, didn't just come to set you free from judgment. He came to set you free to a new life. Where are we going to see Israel heading after this point? They're going to start making their journey to the promised land. It wasn't just to get them out of Egypt, but it was to take them to the most incredible place possible. That's what God has done for us. He wants to bring us into a new life, into his promised land. Forget about Egypt. Forget about what's behind you. God has something new for you. You know, if you haven't this morning, you can receive Christ as your Passover lamb today. I never want to assume that simply because you've shown up at church that you've put your faith in Christ. And so I want to pray at this time. And and you know what? Uh, If you haven't put your faith in Christ, now is the time. Now is the time to turn from your sin and to put your hope and your trust in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this incredible picture of Jesus that we get. And I thank you that you came as our Passover lamb that you have made a way for us to walk in freedom and a new life, to have a new start. Lord, I want to first of all pray for those this morning that are here that that perhaps are struggling with the leaven, the sin that is in their lives. I thank you, God, that yes, we work, but Lord, it's, it's you who works in us to will and to act according to your purposes and your plans. I pray for strength, Jesus. I pray that the Passover lamb that died for each and every one of us here would not just be uh, an idea, but actual living out in us, within us. That, that the very presence of Christ would give us the strength to say no to the things that we need to say no to. I want to pray as well, Father, for anybody that might be here this morning or perhaps tuning in later as they watch this video online that does not know you, that, that maybe has not put their faith in you that God, this would be the day where they they realize that all their best efforts don't add up. It doesn't count. It doesn't work. That only you were the perfect spotless lamb without blemish. Only you could pay the price for our sin. And I pray, Father, for anyone here this morning, that they would just begin now to to accept and to receive as we read John 1, 12 told us. Then you give us the right to become a children of child of God simply by putting our faith and our trust and our hope in you in the work that you did on the cross in our place. And Lord, maybe there's some this morning that are here that, that maybe this is a hundredth time that they need to kind of come back and say, okay, I've just struggled. I've been gone a different direction. That today would be that day that they come back to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you again for this time that we can be together. And we give you all the glory now. Amen. Amen. Well, church, thank you so much for joining us us this morning. Uh, We'll be back here again next Sunday. And on a moment's notice, if they happen to open up restrictions for us to be inside, we can move inside. We'll still be socially distanced. It'll probably still be masks, all those kinds of things. But uh, we're meeting regardless, Sunday mornings. So good to see you. And I look look forward to seeing you again next week. Blessings on you guys.